Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center. Hot, cold, or warm with Lee Vinden. Well, welcome. We're so happy that you could join us. And we're looking forward to this series, The Revelation of Whom? And especially tonight's subject, hot, cold, or warm. You know, we've got a, a water cooler in uh, the lobby at 3ABN. And it has hot, cold, or warm. And uh, I always refer to that warm as Laodicean. And uh, so when I go through, sometimes I will tease Mary, who's working there at the, at the desk, and I'll say, I'm getting ready to have a cup of Laodicean water. And uh, the truth is, I really prefer the cold water uh, to, uh, to that lukewarm water. But this is going to be a very interesting subject. We're living in a time, folks, when we better get serious about having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we can do everything we can to proclaim the gospel, and I believe in that. Going forth, the blessing is on the go. But I believe that what God would have us to do more than anything else is to prepare ourselves through a relationship with Jesus, knowing Him. That's our first work and our first responsibility. And that is the direction that we're talking about in this series. Our speaker, Pastor Lee Vinden, 30 years a pastor, been a Bible teacher. Uh, my son John had the privilege of having Lee Vinden when he was in his junior and senior years at Campion Academy. And uh, since night, uh, 2008, rather, he has been a revivalist in the Upper Columbia Conference. He's written three books, and he is the author of a of a Bible study lesson series entitled More About Jesus. Uh, his wife is Margie. Uh, they've been married 36 years, and they have two wonderful children, a son, Chris, and a daughter, Lindsay. And uh, this is a man who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that when he was my son's Bible teacher, he was his favorite Bible teacher, uh, throughout all, and he had, from first grade on, John was in our schools, but he'll tell you, or at least second grade, uh, he will tell you that uh, this was his favorite uh, Bible teacher. So tonight, we're looking forward to this presentation, and we are going to invite the Lord especially to be with us, and uh, before C.A. Murray comes to sing, I'd like for us to have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight that we can come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray that you will enter into our hearts, speak to our minds, help us to listen as the Spirit is speaking to our hearts. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us for giving us life eternal and the assurance of that life through Jesus. Help us to look to him and to love him with all of our hearts. And in his precious name we ask it. Amen. You know, it's a real privilege to work with everyone we work with here at 3ABN. I, I enjoy it. My wife will tell you uh, this last weekend we we're gone. We enjoyed very much being at Avon Park and being with those dear people down there. But uh, also, we had some other things to do. We even cut some of those short, came back a day early uh, because we, we miss being here with, with the people at 3ABN. We love working with them. One of those that we are really privileged to work with is Pastor C.A. Murray. He loves the Lord, and he loves this ministry, and we love to hear him sing, and he's going to sing one of my very favorite hymns, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place.
My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. I need no other evidence. I need no other It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He will not cast me out. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. The great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other evidence, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. My soul is resting on his word, the living word of God. Salvation in my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no is enough that Jesus died. Wow. Aren't you glad that he succeeded on his mission? I want to speak to him one more time, if that would be all right. I think we can probably not have too much prayer, so I'm just going to pray one more prayer, please. Lord Jesus, I am um, Twitter-pated. That would be a good way to say it. And I need the Holy Spirit to just dwell inside my mind, my tongue. I want that for every one of us as we look together in your direction, but I particularly ask for some sort of miracle right now. I'd like to feel the cruise control take over. I'd like to feel the gas pedal suddenly go on some other power than my own. And so I'm asking for you to do that. And you told us that we could ask. And that you delight in giving us the answer to this request. So I'm praying for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're doing a series, five-part series, and it's entitled <clears throat> Revelation of Whom? And I think that uh, there's no question who we're talking about here. We're talking about Jesus with a capital J. Um, there are a, a lot of different ways that you can study the book of Revelation. There are many different applications. There are many different ways to unpack it. But the uh, angle that I am interested in pursuing in the next few presentations is going to be what I'm going to call experiential with Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus in Revelation. It, after all, it's his book, and um, it's the revelation of Jesus. So I want to find Jesus in it. I want to hear Jesus in it. I want to know Jesus in it. So that's what we're going to do together. We're going to look in his direction, and uh, he's promised to reveal himself to us. When I was about probably in fifth grade, we lived in a little town called Grand Junction, Colorado. And uh, in that town, there was a family. They were, uh, lived up on a hill outside of town. Johnny Watkins was the name of the gentleman and his wife, Ann. And uh, there was a doctor in our church whose name was Dr. Stute. Now, Johnny and the doctor were good friends, but they were always trying to find a way to one-up the other in terms of a teasing or a practical joke or a prank. And so that was kind of a common fare for them. Well, there's one I still remember, even though I was only in fifth grade when it happened. But the Watsons had most of the church family out early in the spring when the first strawberries had come for a church fellowship kind of an evening of fun together. And it was a Sunday evening. And one of the things they had done was they had arranged to have strawberry shortcake with the first strawberries of spring and homemade shortcake, and Anne's famous topping, whipped cream with a special secret ingredient. Well, among the people who were there that night was Dr. Stute. And when the strawberry shortcake came out and was delivered, oh my, you could hear the people commenting all through the house and out onto the porch and the lawn. This has got to be the best treat we've had in ages. Strawberries, already, strawberries. And... Um, and what is your secret ingredient in that whipping cream? It is something else. Well, she said, I told you it wouldn't be a secret any longer. And people ate and devoured it, asked for seconds. Dr. Stute enjoyed his, it appeared. But after the event was over, around 2.30 in the morning, Dr. Stute called Johnny Watson on the phone. He said, I'm sorry to waken you at such a undecent hour, indecent hour, but he said, um, did anybody else call you with a problem from the strawberry shortcake? He said, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but everybody seemed to be saying it was good, and so I ate mine, but he said there was something about, something about the whipping cream that just didn't go well with me. In fact, I'm feeling sick right now, and I keep belching up the taste of the whipping cream. And, I, you know, has anybody else called you uh, to, to talk about this whipping cream? And Johnny said, no, Doc, you're the only one that had shaving cream. Why would anybody else call? <laughs> they had put beautiful, creamy, white shaving cream on his strawberries. And everyone else was enjoying theirs and commenting. And so Dr. Stute thought, it just uh, must be my palate this morning or this evening. I just not quite. And he ate it, ate it all, and then woke up blowing bubbles. <laughs> well, the point of it was that that strawberry shortcake looked like something on the outside that it wasn't really in reality. It looked like something that it wasn't. We're going to see how that illustration ties in as we take a little look here in the third chapter of Revelation. I'm going to be reading verses 14 and 15. And if you had a uh, red letter addition to your Bible, you would discover that these are being red letters because Jesus is the one who is speaking here. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, 
that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So what is Jesus saying here? As he talks to this church called the Laodicean church, he says, I wish you were cold or hot. Well, um, apparently God prefers cold to lukewarm. Because this church is lukewarm, and he says, I wish you were either cold or hot. Well, if we were going to try and explain cold and hot, I suppose we would say a hot person would be someone who is plugged into a rich, deep, meaningful, personal experience with the Lord Jesus and communes with him regularly and faithfully and loves to meet with him in his word and, and so on, has a meaningful prayer life. We call that person a hot person. And if we were going to try and describe a cold person, I suppose we would probably describe somebody who is a rebellious sort that has no interest in the things of God, no interest in time or eternity, just living for the moment and uh, indifferent to anything that we might call spiritual. We call them cold, maybe even rebellious, all right? Now here, Jesus is saying that God prefers cold-hearted, rebellious people over lukewarm people, which seems a little odd at first read. Um... Why would God prefer cold over warm? Well, have you ever been cold? <laughs> when you're cold, you want to be hot. You know, you look for a hot shower to come into after you've been out in that cold we weather. Uh, you, t you, well, you bundle up, you put on a coat, you put on a down jacket, you get in the car and turn the heater on. Last night, I spent some time sleeping in a car um, and my wife had said to me, ought, ought you to take your light little down jacket with you on this trip just in case. I said, oh, spring weather, the flowers are going to be out. Who needs a down jacket? That would be overkill. But just as I was leaving the car to get to the plane, my wife said, you should stuff it. It doesn't take up much space. Just stuff it in. Well, I stuffed it into my suitcase, my little carry-on. And I'm so glad I did because I ended up on the side of the road last night uh, I had missed my plane, and I didn't get here until 3 in the morning. And I ended up the side of the road last night, and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to put the down coat on, and I'm going to, I'm going to try and sleep, because I couldn't stay awake any longer. And I'm going to try and sleep. I slept for about an hour, and then I woke up cold. My joke, my coat, my down coat was keeping this part warm, but the rest of me was cold, you know. I started the car. And I turned the heat to the full it could go, and the, I turned the fan as far as it would go because I wanted to be hot. And I got so hot that it was unbearable in the car, unbearably hot. Then I turned it off, and it lasted for another hour and a half. So I, I got it so warm that I was able to sleep another hour and a half that way. So. But when you're cold, you want to be hot. You want to be hot. You're looking for something. When you're warm, you're not really concerned about in, any change in your situation. But when you're cold, you are interested in a change in your situation. Now, how does God feel about lukewarm? Well, let's keep looking. Verse 16, Revelation 3, uh, Jesus continues to tell us. He says, so then, because you are lukewarm, talking to Laodicean church now, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What's he saying? Uh, we could be really crass and crude, and we could say, uh, when God sees the lukewarm, it just it makes him want to puke. You know? You give me the urge to regurge, is what he's saying to the church at Laodicea. I just want to throw up when I see you. Well, why would God want to throw up when he sees Laodiceans? Well, because they think they're okay and they think they don't need anything. So they're not looking for a change in their situation and yet their situation is actually desperate. However, they don't realize it and they're not looking. Now, he, he calls this the message to the church at Laodicea. Um, in order for a church... To be called Laodicean, and I got a kick out of hearing about the Laodicean water dispenser you have here um, at 3ABN. But in order for a church to be Laodicean, more than 50% of the members would have to be Laodicean. You follow what I'm saying? Because if it wasn't more than 50%, you'd call it something else. You know, you, whatever. It has to be more than 50% in order to call it 
that. So, more than 50% of this church is lukewarm, the Laodicean church that we're talking about. Um, the majority of the people then, the majority of the people in this last day's church that Jesus is describing because we understand that this church represents the church just prior to the return of Jesus. The majority of the people in this church are going to be lukewarm, or they wouldn't call it Laodicean. Now, I went on uh, Google this afternoon, and I went on uh, the Wikipedia, and I looked up the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North American Division, and I found out that we have just a little over, approximately, just a little over one million people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America whose names are registered on church books somewhere as members. Members. Okay. So let's just work with that number for a minute. A little over a million. That means that more than 500,000 of them would be lukewarm. Doesn't that sort of shock you when you put it that way? More than 500,000 of them would be lukewarm. Remember, Jesus is describing the church just before he comes. Something's going to happen to change this. And we're going to get there, but not, we're not there yet. We're just talking about things as he describes them. So more than 500,000 lukewarm church members. Now, um, if this is of any comfort to you, this message is not limited to Seventh-day Adventists. This message applies to all of the churches all around the globe. Um, God has people in every church. He also has lukewarm people in every church. And one day something's going to happen to change the lukewarm, but at, at the present time, there are more than half of the members around the world of all the churches qualify here as the last day uh, church that Jesus is describing in Revelation 3. Um, if the majority are lukewarm, then you would expect to find lukewarm people in positions of leadership. You'd expect to find them in uh, institutions. You'd expect to find them as instructors. You would expect to find them as educators. You would expect to find them as administrators. You would expect to find them as pastors. You'd expect to find them as members. Uh, if, if more than 50% are lukewarm, then more than 50% of all those different groups that I just described would fall into that category, all right? Well, <clears throat> what is lukewarm? At my house, we have a faucet, one of those old-fashioned kind where it has a knob on each side. We have another one in another part of the house that has one knob that goes up and left or right. But, you know, if you just have the two knobs, if if you turn the one on the left at my house, hot water comes out. If you turn the one on the right, cold water. If you turn them both on together and try to get some sort of equal mix, then you end up with warm. We would call it lukewarm. Well, Jesus is referring to lukewarm religious people in Matthew 23, and he calls them hypocrites. I want to read that one off the, off the screen with you. Matthew 23, verses 27 to 28. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So, Jesus' way of describing a lukewarm person is to say you look different on the outside than you are on the inside. Like the shaving cream on top of the strawberries, it looks different. It looked good, though. Dr. Stute suckered for it. It looked good enough that he ate it, you know. But it really wasn't what it looked like. And Jesus is saying, you are like a whitewashed tomb. It, the sepulcher looks pretty good on the outside. Nice engraving, you know, it's beautiful. But on the inside, corruption. Dead men's bones. Well, let's just think a little bit about those people that Christ was speaking to when he said that, what we just read from Matthew 23. The people he was speaking to, he said, you search the scriptures. 
uh, they were familiar with the Bible. They knew it backwards and forwards, the Bible as, as they knew it, which we would call perhaps the Old Testament type scriptures, the, the writings of Moses and the prophets, right? They were familiar. These are people that, that Jesus was talking to who returned tithes and offerings. These are people whom Jesus was talking to who had a health message. These are people who had their kids enrolled in Christian education, you might call a counterpart, Christian education. These are people who had studied prophecy hugely. They were major students of Bible prophecy. They had timelines, charts. They had it all mapped out. They knew exactly what to expect. Um, they had family worship every evening. And yet Jesus said, you look good on the outside, but inside you're rotten. You're filled with corruption. Um, <clears throat> that's a pretty good list of descriptors that we just noted about these people. They look pretty good. Go down the line, check those things off, but trouble, trouble. The Titanic looked good. I've seen pictures of it. It looked good. It was tied up to the dock there. But the Titanic, when they, they, they did some research after it sunk, and they concluded that there was too much sulfur in the uh, steel that was being used for the hull. And when you put too much sulfur in steel, I, I'm not an authority on this, I just read this, okay? So, but when you put too much sulfur into steel, it becomes brittle, like glass. And what happened was, ordinarily, what should have happened is when the Titanic hit the iceberg, it should have dented the steel. Like when you run your bumper into something, it bends the bumper. But because there was too much sulfur, it cracked, it, it, it shattered like glass and the water began pouring in and we know the rest of the story. What was the problem? The Titanic looked like something that it wasn't. It looked different on the outside than it really was on the inside. Lukewarm people go through the motions. They are religious, they do the right things, but they actually are doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Um, and Jesus rebuked them. He said, you make me sick. You are religious, but you are not spiritual. Are you familiar with the difference between religious and spiritual? It's possible to know the rules without knowing the ruler. It is possible to know the laws without knowing the Lord. It is possible to know the facts without knowing the friend. It is possible to know the Sabbath as a day without knowing the Lord of the Sabbath as a person. Amen. So the difference between religious and spiritual kind of lies in those differences that I was just comparing here a moment ago. Uh, Jesus said, you lukewarm people are high on the standards, but you're low on knowing Christ. That's the problem. That's the problem of the church of Laodicea. They're high on the standards, but they're low on personal relationship with Jesus. That's why I appreciated Pastor Gelly saying at the very beginning, uh, there's nothing more urgent or more important for us at this time of earth's history than to have a personal relationship with Jesus, a personal one. Jesus revealed in the book of Revelation what the last church would look like until just before he comes again. Now, unfortunately, many people have thought that the way you get the warm to become hot is by preaching what they call the straight testimony. And um, that can look like a lot of different things, but um, it often comes across like legislating standards. If we can get people to hold the standards, even raise the standards, we can move the warm to being hot by legislating standards. Standards, But legislated standards do not change hearts. They don't change hearts. My father, my, my dad passed away last February, just a little over a year ago. He was a preacher. And uh, that same church that had the, I, the, the strawberry shortcake that I told you about, he pastored there. That's back now when I was about in fifth grade. And they were studying during the midweek service, they were studying the subject of revival. And the church members who were coming to the midweek service said, we like that. We want, we want, to, we want to experience a revival right here. And so they said, um, we, need to, we need to change, we need to raise the standards if we really want to have revival. So one of the standards they decided to raise was they needed to do away with anything that appeared to have any tie or connection to jewelry. Got to get rid of anything that was like jewelry, get rid of that. 
And my dad thought, you know, well, relief, because he certainly didn't wear any jewelry, so he figured that, you know, he wasn't going to be inhibiting revival. Uh, until the word got back to him that they were talking about him out in the congregation as he would preach from Sabbath to Sabbath. And, and, and he found out the reason they were was because he was actually wearing a tie clasp on his tie. Had a little tie clasp there. And actually it was, um, it was made out of chrome. And so there were times when if he moved just right, it would glint in the light. Well, anything that glints, that's adornment, you see. And so the people said, Pastor Vinna, we can't ever experience a revival with you wearing a tie clasp you got to get rid of that tie clasp. So he, he went home, he took off his tie clasp. But then he found that he had a problem because his tie kept, it potluck, his tie kept drifting into the soup. And now he had his tie soiled, but, you know, at least he wasn't inhibiting revival. And so, but, you know, his tie wasn't too good. So as a way of trying to solve his problem with his tie, he was rummaging around in the bathroom one, in the drawers one, one day, and he found bobby pins, some bobby pins. Well, he, he put a bobby pin. He said, well, that works. It's dark, you know. Doesn't glint in the sun or anything. So he put this bobby pin on. And, and his tie quit falling in the soup. And, and, you know. And then he said he actually began to feel a little bit proud of his bobby pin. You know, because he said people would say to him, Pastor Ben, what is that bobby pin on your tie? And he would say, uh, it's a bobby pin because I don't believe in jewelry. I don't wear tie class. I don't believe in jewelry. And he would feel very pr pious and, and pr proud about his bobby pin. He said he even found out you could get different colored bobby pins to match different colored ties. And uh, he said that he discovered that the latter state of that man was worse than the first. <laughs> because now he was uh, proud of his... Uh, his um, spirituality, you know, falsely called, but proud of it. Legislated standards do not change hearts. Now, I'm not in favor of lowering standards. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we should lower standards. But I'm just saying that raising standards is not what brings on revival. That's the point, raising standards. Working on externals, hear me carefully here now, Working on externals is the very thing that Jesus says is wrong with, with, with Laodicea. He says you clean up the outside, but your inside is not right. So if you're trying to get rid of Laodicea by working on standards, that's external, and you're actually perpetuating the very thing that Laodicea is known for when you focus on the standards. You see how that works? That's the very problem of Laodicea is it's focused on the external obedience. The kind of obedience and transformation that Jesus wants to work out in us comes from within. It's him indwelling. And as Jesus lives his life in us and through us, we become more and more like him as he works his righteousness out of us from the inside out. The indwelling Christ living his life in us. We sing songs about it. You know, live thy life in me. You know, that kind of thing. That's what he's looking for. Well, what does he say to these Pharisees? In Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees, you religious leaders, you're hypocrites. You are so careful to polish the outside of the cup, but the inside is foul with extortion and greed. Blind Pharisees. First cleanse the inside of the cup, then the whole cup will be clean. Now let's go back on now to uh, Revelation 3.18. The first part of what we have noted in Revelation 3 has been what I'm going to call the rebuke to the church of Laodicea. So far we've looked at the rebuke. Now notice what we're going to look at next. It's going to be called the counsel. And isn't it wonderful that God never rebukes without giving counsel. He always says, this is the problem, here's the solution. Here's the problem, here's the solution. All right, so let's look at the counsel. Revelation 3.18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Now, Gold, white clothes or white raiment, and salve. Uh, what are these things? What do they represent? Well, <clears throat> I want to share something with you from uh, our church periodical written many years ago. You can uh, find it if you dig back into your, uh, into your garage to the stack that's there in the back corner. Here it is. The council of the true witness does not represent 
those who are lukewarm as a hopeless case. Now, that's good news. Because just a moment ago, I said more than 500,000 then of the church members of any, tip, any church in North America are going to be characterized as lukewarm. But that doesn't need to be a cause for despair because it says the council uh, show, shows that we do not need to see ourselves in a hopeless case. The Laodicean message is full of encouragement. Full of encouragement. The backslidden church may still buy the gold. Now, what is the gold? The gold of faith and love. And they may still have the white robe of the righteousness of Christ that the shame of their nakedness need not appear. Okay, so what is the gold and what is the right raiment? And also, what is the ISAV? We are told the ISAV is the Holy Spirit bringing discernment and understanding concerning our need of our Savior in a personal relationship with Him. So that's what the ISAB is. So we could, come, we could summarize Jesus' counsel this way. Jesus' counsel is, you need my righteousness, which comes through faith, and you need love brought into your heart. And these are the gifts that re result as the Holy Spirit works in you when you abide in me. Okay, so we're talking here now about a personal relationship with Jesus as the counsel to the church at Laodicea. Now, when Jesus comes, there's going to be no such thing as a lukewarm person. You know, when Jesus comes, there's only two groups. There's no longer three. There's the hot and the cold. There's the righteous and the wicked. There's the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, the wise and the foolish. Everywhere you go through Scripture, when it comes down to the final events, there's only two groups. Only two groups. So, something happens just before Jesus comes that causes the middle group to disappear. You could say they go hot or cold all over. Sometimes I've said that, you know, if I, just recently, last week, I was walking with my wife along a little path outdoors and a snake went, went slithering across my trail. I hate snakes. I, 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 I just despise them. This is a tiny little thing, but I tell you what, I went hot and cold all over. Just, just seeing that snake, it just went hot and cold all over. Well, just before Jesus comes, the lukewarm are going to go hot or cold all over. Stop, stop being warm. There, there's a little rhyme that says, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good and when she was bad, she was horrid. You know what it is. All right. That's what's going to happen just before Jesus comes. Well, how does it happen? What, what, what takes place? And why does it take place? God moves in and God picks up speed at the very end. And as God moves in and picks up speed, we're told the final movements are going to be what? rapid ones, the, 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 the warm start going one way or the other. There's going to come a time in our world when Jesus waits no longer. He, uh, we have often talked about the privilege that is ours of hastening his coming. But the idea of hastening a coming implies or carries with it that there is a point in time in which he comes whether we hastened it or not. You don't hasten something unless it's already going to happen. You can make it happen quick, more quickly, but it's going to happen whether you hasten it or not. Okay? See, I figured out on Google uh, uh, today also how far it was. If I had driven instead of flown here, it was 1,973 miles from where I live. Then I punched into my calculator and I discovered that if I had driven that at 60 miles an hour, it would have taken me 33 hours. That's not stopping for the bathroom or gas. That's just 33 hours of nonstop driving. Then I thought, well, what if I changed it from 60 to 70 because there's a lot of speed limits on the interstates that say 70. Well, that changes it to 28 hours instead of 33. I can hasten my trip by going 70 instead of 60. But if I go 60, I'm still going to get here. All right? So we have had the privilege of hastening the return of Christ. But he's going to come whether we hasten it or not. He's going to come. He's, he's got a time figured out when he's coming. And um, I believe that that point that he's planning to come is not based on the clock. I believe it's based on world conditions. World conditions. I believe the world is going to reach a point where it is so rotten 
That if he didn't come, there'd be nobody left to come for because we'd be on the verge of self-destruction implosion. Billy Graham, I believe, is the one who said, if um, Jesus doesn't come soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because we are approaching their wickedness and it wouldn't surprise me if we don't pass it. And so then he'd have to apologize. See, So I believe there's conditions, world conditions. And when our world reaches that point, God is going to pull out all the stops, as they say for the organist. Pull out all the stops. Romans 9, 28 says when he finishes the work he's going to cut it short in righteousness because the Lord is actually going to be the one who makes a short work of the earth upon the earth so as God finishes his work a great polarization takes place and the lukewarm disappear have you noticed if, probably many of you haven't because you're not as old as I am I'm getting, I'm on, I, am on, I have crossed the threshold of age and um, now I notice things and say things that I used to hear older people say but I say them now but um, 50 years ago, on television, 50 years ago, Mary Tyler Moore and Dick Van Dyke were required to wear pajamas that buttoned all the way up to their necks. They had to wear wedding bands and they had to sleep in twin beds because the censors for the, for the networks the, said, we will not have anything. These people aren't married. They're actors and actresses and we're not having them in the same bed that would just look like scandal we're not going to put our actors and our actresses in a compromised situation so they're going to sleep in twin beds that was the Dick Van Dyke show 50 years ago I don't think I need to tell you how things have changed commercials are worse uh, than what any censor would have ever dreamed back 50 years ago. Okay, so that's just one example. I just grabbed that one out of the hat. But there are all kinds of examples where the world is becoming increasingly wicked at the same time. It is also becoming increasingly interested in spiritual things too. You see both camps forming. You see both camps forming. You see, more, for example, 50 years ago, the only place you could get a Christian book would be at camp meeting at the ABC. Now you can buy Christian books at Walmart. Did you know that when they were selling The Passion of Christ, that DVD, it came with The Desire of Ages? Did you know that? It was packaged. I, I actually saw it with my own eyes. I saw it. The Passion of Christ, packaged with The Desire of Ages, Christian book. You can get this at Walmart. This is a lot different than 50 years ago. So what I'm trying to say is, we're seeing the world conditions polarizing. We're seeing the wicked become more wicked, and we're seeing an increased interest in spiritual things and in the things of God as well, simultaneously. That's a good sign. That is a good sign. The message of Jesus and his righteousness is rising. And as it rises, the result is going to be a genuine, true remnant church. Now you might say, well, what do you mean by a genuine, true remnant church? Prior to lukewarm's disappearance, so when they're still lukewarm, the remnant church is remnant doctrinally, but not experientially. It has it here, but it doesn't have it here. When God finishes what he's going to do and the polarization is concluded, his remnant are going to have it here and here, not just here, Amen. not just here. And when that happens, well, uh, John 4.23 says, uh, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. Remember her? And she, um, she asked him um, what kind of worship God was interested in most as a diversion because she got a little bit nervous when he talked about her personal life. And he said, whoa. She says, you must be a prophet. Could we change the subject? Let's talk about God's worship style and so on. So then she asked him a question. And uh, it went up on the screen, but I ended up digressing. I'll come back to it now. And, and, and Jesus said to that woman, the hour, you want to know what kind of worship God's looking for? The hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, God, the kind of worship God's looking for is two kind. He's looking for spirit and truth. It's like saying heart and head. See, if you're in a rowboat and you only have one oar, you're going to go in a circle. In order for the rowboat to make any kind of progress, you have to have both oars in the water. And Jesus is saying, it's not enough to have it here if you don't have it here. It's not enough. Just having it here is not enough to save anybody. Knowing the facts, knowing the doctrine, knowing the truth. That, 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 see, have you ever heard people say, um, please pray for my son or my daughter, they left the truth? Or uh, we've been in the truth for this X number of years. Or I first found the truth. Ever heard that phrase? 
Generally, when people use that phrase, they're referring to a set of theological beliefs, of doctrines, of scriptural uh, aligning things together and saying, okay, this is the truth. They're talking about, basically, theology and doctrine. That's usually what they're referring to, okay? But Jesus said, I am the way, the what? The truth. The truth is a capital T. The truth is a person. It's something more than head knowledge. It's a person. And when Jesus talked to that woman, he said the kind of truth that God has led, the kind of people that God is looking for is people who worship him in spirit and in truth, both head and heart. Well, as God starts to finish the work, a shaking takes place in the church. And I believe this shaking takes place in every church, every denomination around the world. Right now, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and I intend to stay that way. And so I, I'm referencing my own church. But I believe this is happening in all churches. All churches. What happens is the shaking takes place. Very interesting. Long-standing members start leaving. And backsliders start returning. Isn't that weird? People who have been in the church for 60 years leave. And people who left in discouragement come back. That's one of the results of the shaking. Well, what causes the shaking? The little book, Early Writings, page 70, says this. The shaking is caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Now, please refresh yourself. Just a moment ago, we noted what the counsel was to the church at Laodicea. The counsel was the need for a personal relationship with Jesus... Faith and love, the ISEB of the Holy Spirit who reveals our need of a Savior and a union and communion with Him on an ongoing basis. That's the counsel. That's the counsel. Now, this is a real puzzler because it said there in, that, in that early writings, page 70, it said the shaking is not caused by rebuke. The shaking is not caused by raising standards. The shaking is caused by the counsel of the true witness. Which is another way of saying then that what causes the shaking is an increased focus and interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, isn't that a puzzle? Why that would cause people to go one way or another, you would think that a focus on Jesus would be embraced by everybody, both in the church and out of the church, you know? You would think. But it actually ends up causing a lot of lukewarm people to leave completely. Why? Why would an emphasis on Jesus cause people to leave? Well, because they have been substituting something else for their security. What have they been substituting? They have been substituting external goodness. They have been substituting intellectual understanding of truth they have, been, they have been substituting theological purity in doctrine for a personal experience with Jesus. They've been substituting that. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have both. You can have both or Jesus wouldn't have said here and here, right? But if someone gets unhappy with a focus on Jesus, it's because they have been depending on something other than Jesus. They have been living their stainless, pure life apart from him. And when someone comes along and says that doesn't count, they get angry. I was preaching at a camp meeting in Alberta, Canada. And I mentioned this. And after the meeting, a gentleman came up. He had white hair and a beard. And he started poking me with his finger in my chest. And he stood there to, after the meeting and he said to me, don't tell me that all of my staying out of trouble for 60 years doesn't amount to some brownie points in heaven. I don't have that daily time with God that you talk about and I don't need it. I have stayed out of trouble. I have kept my nose clean. I have stayed, I've got a clean slate and God knows that and it doesn't matter what you say. Don't give me that kind of nonsense. He was mad. He was mad that I was telling him just staying out of trouble doesn't get anyone to heaven. Just raising standards doesn't get anyone to heaven. You have to know Jesus. What's the root word of Christian? Christ. If you don't know Christ, just knowing biblical truth isn't going to be enough to save you. is isn't going to be enough. Remember, the people who killed Jesus knew what day to go to church on. You know, 
but they killed Jesus. It's, it's not enough to have a biblical knowledge or understanding if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. It's all for naught. I, got, uh, I had some members of uh, one of the churches I pastored pr prior to what we're doing right now. Um, uh, a group of my actual elders and some of the key leaders in my church, board members, sent a letter to my conference president, my boss, my CEO, and the letter, they sent me a copy of it because they wanted me to see what they were complaining about. They actually signed the letter. There was about half a dozen of them, and some of them had been, before they retired, uh, they had been uh, influential leaders in the world church and denomination and so on, I mean, it was, and they signed their name. And this is what they wrote to my president. They said, we're getting tired of all of the sermons being forever and always about Jesus. What we would like is some good old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventist preaching down here for a change. That's what they wrote. That was the letter. Well, what were they thinking? They were thinking good old-fashioned Adventist preaching wouldn't be about Jesus. It would be about truth, truth, truth. Make sure they know what the truth is. Hit them with the truth. And if they don't know the truth, man, they're in deep trouble. We know the truth. And if they want to be correct, they want to sign up with us. If they don't sign up with us, they don't have the truth. That's good old-fashioned. But my conference president wrote them back a letter and he sent me a copy. And he said, I'm looking forward to the day when I get complaints like yours from every church in my conference. <laughs> I want Jesus to be first and foremost in every church. I want Jesus to be the subject matter and the theme of every congregation. And I said, thank you. It's wonderful to work for a boss like that. Well... <clears throat> I said that the people who have been depending on their goodness instead of their relationship with Jesus, they get unhappy and they leave. But at the same time, backsliders, people who left because they couldn't produce the goodness on their own. They had tried to keep the rules. They had given it their best shot. They had been sincere about trying. Like the Israelites, all that the Lord has said we will do. They had tried. They had been told, this is the truth, this is it, you know, walk in it, and so on. So they're gonna, but they kept falling and flopping and failing. They got so bruised and bloody that in discouragement, they left. They thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to add hypocrisy to failure. I'm just going to check out. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't walk this talk. And they left. But along comes this emphasis on Jesus. Remember, the counsel to the church at Laodicea is what causes the shaking. And what is it? They're told, Jesus wants to be your friend. And if you are involved in a personal relationship with him, he promises to work in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He promises to complete the work he has begun in your life. He promises to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. It is a gift. And he's asking you, he's inviting you into a relationship with him. And he's saying, if you will, if you will enter into fellowship with me, I will, I will transform you into my likeness. That is good news. And when backsliders hear that, they say, oh I must have left too soon if it's about who and not what then I have a chance Amen. if it's about who and not what <clears throat> so the last thing that happens just before Jesus comes is people trade places those who have not chosen to be in relationship with Jesus leave remember when he cleansed the temple the second time you can read about this it's very interesting the people who leave were religious people. The people who stayed were the bruised and the battered, the helpless and the hopeless. They stayed, and he healed them. Remember the story? He healed them. And the religious people were unhappy about it. But he ministered to the hopeless and the helpless. And so the weak and the infirmed, and I would also suggest the strong who actually realize that they are weak even though they appear strong. Those are the people who embrace this message of Jesus wanting to be friends. Can we be friends? Can we be friends? That's his message to you and to me. Well, <clears throat> those weak and infirmed open the door to Jesus so he can come home. Or maybe I, could, I should say respond to his knock and open the door. I have a friend, Carl Hafner. He's a pastor over in Kettering um, in Ohio. And he has a little girl. Her name is Claire. She's not such a little girl anymore, but my wife taught her as a kindergartner in school. And Claire uh, has loved the Word of God. She just loves, and, and ever since a little, little girl, she loves the Word of God. 
And she wrote her own paraphrase of Revelation 3.20. And I want you to see what she wrote. She wrote this as a fifth grader. A fifth grader. Revelation 3.20. Notice this. Knock, knock. And the reason I say it, the CH, um, CHV is that's the Claire Hafner version. That's the verb. Okay, so here it is. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Jesus who? Jesus Christ. Oh, really? And what do you want? Well... I'd like to come in and hang out with you. Have dinner. Talk. No big agenda. Just be friends. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. I'm still here. Knocking. Remember he said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Isn't it sad how many of us have not opened the door because we have been distracted with other things? See, when Jesus knocks on the door, I don't want to be sidetracked with my bank account. When Jesus knocks on the door, I don't want to be sidetracked with my new car or my new boat or my new toy. When Jesus knocks on the door, I don't want to be watching television so that I can't hear him above the late night show. When Jesus knocks on the door, I don't want to be so distracted with current events and the news, which is usually nothing more than a report on what the devil's been doing for the last 24 hours, that I don't have time to hear his knock or run to the door. I don't want to, when Jesus knocks at the door, I don't want to be so distracted with my earphones and my iPhones and my iPads and my headsets and my music and I don't want to be so distracted that I can't hear him. When he rings the doorbell, I don't want to be so consumed with my, my school and my education or my job or my career that I don't have time to open the door. When Jesus knocks... I want to open the door and have him come in and fellowship with me and I with him. And guess what? Even if you don't think you have anything to offer him, if you say, like old Mother Hubbard, I go there and the cupboard is bare, he brings everything with him. Isn't that good? And he lays out for you a, uh, a table full of the bread of life and the water of life. And he says, let's eat. And the best part of eating is you're going to eat with him. The counsel to the church at Laodicea is let's fellowship with Jesus. Let's respond to his knock on our heart's door. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being interested in us enough to want to hang out with us. To want a no big agenda. Just to be friends. To share a meal. To share life. Forgive us for being distracted far too easily with things that are going to rot or rust or burn and, and, and encourage us, Lord. Strengthen us to, to hear the knock and to open the door and, and to share with others the good news.